If it seems like tape trading and the video file were booming with no limits or concerns, then why was this woman photographed with a mislabeled tape? What secret message was this magazine cover sending? Yes, the joy and the bonding of the original tape trading scene suffered a blow when it became apparent that someone else was secretly keeping tabs on them. In one year, as I recall, I think I did nine talk shows on home video. I remember one time I did a talk show and we were talking about the FBI and how you're not supposed to record movies that are, you know, that you weren't supposed to have and copyright violations and all this. And I'm on the air absolutely telling everybody don't do stupid things and kind of sending him down the right road i thought at least on this talk show in flint now early the next morning and i was half asleep the phone rings and the guy says this is the fbi and we want to talk to you about home video i want to come out to see you it came to our attention that the fbi and the motion picture industry were all monitoring our ads the guys did come out to my house uh I don't think I had anything really illegal in the house. I mean, I may have had something that was not totally kosher. I just stashed that stuff away. I had a friend who was a film collector, and because he had some films on tape that were kind of questionable as far as being legal, he actually mislabeled them on purpose. So if the FBI ever came over his house, uh, they wouldn't see anything that would be questionable. And it came to my attention that the FBI had a subscription to the magazine. We, he, Glenn wouldn't come down. We asked Glenn to come down. So go to Glenn. But, so, you, you, we can't even get him at the other end of the room. He, uh, Glenn, Glenn is from, from Columbus, and he uh, refuses to come on camera. Uh, well, he's afraid, he's afraid this tape will fall into the wrong hands. That's right. Where is the distribution on this It's going directly to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We think from what we heard that there may have been an FBI agent or two at our last video con, and after that, we stopped doing it. None of us got in trouble, and we never got contacted. Again, nothing was being sold, so I don't think they could get us for just trading, but uh, we were worried about it, so we just stopped the conventions. Also around this time, tape traders and video file personnel were subpoenaed for a legal battle that threatened all sorts of criminal consequences for this hobby. Nobody knew where this was headed. So I came back from lunch to my office for a, the day before my birthday, and they were going to have a party for me. And there was one other guest there at the party that I didn't recognize uh, served me the subpoena. I had only produced five issues of the Video Files newsletter with a circulation of no more than 100 when the studios filed their lawsuit against Sony. As small a figure as I was, I was bigger than most anybody else around. One of the primary columnists for my newsletter, uh, Mark Wilage, was also called in. I got enmeshed in the case because I was visible as a writer for Video File Magazine and soon after Video Review. In 1976, when Sony started to advertise Betamax on commercial television, uh, they went to a variety of movie studios and said, we want to show clips of your movies in our TV commercials for Betamax as examples of things you can record off the air. And they went to Universal and said, we'd love to use, you know, like the Universal monster movies and just have some clips pop up on a TV set in the background. And Universal saw this and said, well, wait a minute, we're not sure we're comfortable with this. But the uh, two or three floors of attorneys in Universal's Black Tower over there in North Hollywood, they were kind of put on red alert and they started thinking about this. And I believe it was by the end of 1976 or the beginning of 1977, Universal joined with Disney and sued Sony over Betamax claiming that this was a facilitator of copyright infringement. It gave ordinary consumers a loaded gun to commit an act of crime, in this case, recording movies off the air. Now, we always believed that it was 
illegal to copy television shows and to duplicate them and reduplicate them and to sell them. That was not in dispute. The question was, could you record these programs and invite a few friends over to your house to watch them? Well, they didn't like that either. I wound up testifying in federal court. Attorneys flew in here from Los Angeles, the, the big name attorneys for Sony and the studios. I gave two depositions, one for Sony and one for Universal. And they wanted uh, to know who all of my subscribers were. They wanted a list of all the tapes that were in my collection. The Universal attorney in federal court actually characterized me as a beta maniac. And they said, well, do you have any Disney titles? Do you have any Universal titles? They had seized about 20 or 30 of my videotapes to use as evidence. Do you intend to record any Disney titles in the future? And I said, by the way, am I ever going to get those tapes back? So well, how often do you have friends over to your house? And he said, well, actually, once we win this case against Sony, you're next. How many people do you have? I just told them I wasn't going to do that. But I'm not going to give you their names, and I'm not going to give you the, the titles. And I said, well, we can get a court order to uh, force you to release that information. We've got you and about another dozen people we're going to sue just as examples of regular American consumers who've used Betamax to steal our property. But I had the advantage of being a lawyer myself, and I said, well, you're welcome to try that. And I was dumbstruck, because I, I thought up to that point I was just uh, a witness to this weird historical happening. And because they traded with me and they had my contact information, I was kind of worried at some point in time that they might contact me about the lawsuit, but it never happened. I guess I got lucky. The, the initial judge, I believe, ruled in uh, Sony's favor. The appeals court, I think, ruled in Universal's favor. But then when it finally went all the way to the Supreme Court, I think it was either in 81 or 82, Luckily for us, the Supreme Court, by a narrow decision, ruled that yes, it was perfectly legal to record a videotape off air. There was a break in the proceedings, and one of the attorneys uh, was engaging in casual conversation with me, which is not in the official record. And he said, you know that movie Earth versus the Flying Saucers. He says, is that the one where the Flying Saucer crashes into the Capitol building? And I said, yeah, that's it. And he said, boy, I wouldn't mind seeing that myself sometime. And I said, well, you, are you still gonna be in town this evening? <laughs>